Hey, you doing? This is Coach DiCarlo. Today we're going to talk about the eye of the needle. Recently I had a YouTube short and it was Steve Harvey speaking and Steve Harvey was talking about the importance of hard work. And he said, you know, bottom line was that rich people don't sleep all day and earn money. He said, if you want to be rich, you can't sleep as it were eight hours a day. And of course, there are those who took issue with it. Some took issue because, of course, many of us believe that the only thing that we have to do is be in our mind and nothing else, and we can manifest. Mind is the first cause of all creation. So when we're talking about mind, they're absolutely correct. Everything that's around you started off as someone's ideal. But if it had only stopped, as so many ideals do, as an ideal, we would not be experiencing those ideals at this moment. There's action that must follow the ideal. And action is the last step, but it's a necessary step. So like I said, some people take you know the issue with saying that you have to work. There is a labor. No matter what it is that we do, we think about going to the store, for example, and we say, well, I need these items. Then we go to the store or we have somebody come from the store and deliver those items. The items have to be brought by physical means. Even with manifestation, if you're manifesting money in your life, there's somebody that's created that money. There's a vehicle that's going to bring you that money. It says, give and it shall be given to you, press down, shaken together, running over. Will men pour into your bosom? Yes, manifestation starts within with your thinking. But you have to go the full course. You have to think, feel, get into the state. But ultimately, there has to be the physical means to bring about that thing that you desire in the physical realm. God uses individuals because, of course, God is spirit. So the way that God operates, he operates through physical beings. God can't do it apart from us. Many will think that that's blasphemy. But understand this. God is spirit. Jesus said it this way, that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit must have a vehicle to occupy in order to carry out the functions within this physical thing we call reality. But now let's talk about the eye of the needle. Somebody else read the Steve Harvey post and they said, listen, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we want to talk about that because a lot of times people that have a spiritual belief about money, sometimes we think that money's evil or we have this thing that, you know, we're separate from money. Money's energy. Money in its essence is life force that's been exchanged. So we've made an agreement that I will exchange my life force for your life force, and we will do it by way of currency, which we call money. Money can't be evil if it's a representation of who we are. Like I said, it's the expanding of energy. And we call that energy in its final phase, its physical phase, money. Someone works eight hours on a job and they're compensated. Somebody may do five minutes and they may get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, and yet they're compensated. Again, what we're talking about is money. And again, money is nothing more than the vehicle of exchange or life force or what we call energy. We've basically said that I will exchange what I do in this earth suit by way of energy for what it is that you do in your earth suit by way of energy. Let's not make money evil. Let's talk about the scripture briefly. It says, there was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus and he says, listen, master, I'll do anything to follow you. And Jesus said, then go sell all that you have, give all that you have to the poor and come follow me. And it was said that the man left dejected and very disappointed. The young man was extremely wealthy. And so Jesus said, it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so then the disciples said, then who can enter in? Why were the disciples so dismayed? We look at what Jesus meant by the term riches, different from what we call riches today. He was talking about the resources and things of daily living that one occupies and trust in. We don't have to be rich or multi-millionaires or billionaires, or whatever, to trust in riches. Sometimes the people that trust in riches the most are those who are broke.
those who are without money, those who are without funds, because only thing they can see is their lack. So, of course, then their trust is in their riches or the lack thereof. When you have resources, then that's not something you worry about. It's like having great health. When you're operating from a place of great health or loving relationships, then you're not worried about great health and loving relationships, likewise with money. But it's those who are lacking money that find it difficult to not focus on money. Again, so the person used the scripture, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Let's talk about this eye of the needle. Many of us think about solely a sewing needle. And that would be one way to look at it. But it's like Jesus was passing the temple and he said this, destroy this temple and in three days I'll lift it back up or I'll raise it back up, I'll build it back up. And then like, you know, who is this man that thinks that he can destroy a temple and build it back up in a matter of three days? What they didn't understand is that Jesus was speaking metaphorically. And likewise, when we're talking about a camel going through the eye of the needle, he's speaking metaphorically, but there was a gate. And if you see behind me, we're going to be looking at this gate here shortly. This is the camel's gate. And if you're in Jerusalem, if you're in Israel, you'll see these. The way that the camels will go through these gates is that the rider of the camel, the owner of the camel, would have to unload the camel, take all the gear off of the camel, and then the camel would go in just with his bare back, and it would go through what they call the eye of the needle. What Jesus wasn't saying was that it was impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But I'll expound more on what it was that he was saying. One of the challenges, even with those of us today who may believe that we're affluent monetarily, and we begin trusting in our monetary wealth, we think that spiritual principles aren't valid. And so what Jesus' point was, was that a person is trusting in the without for their livelihood, for their resources. And again, that could be a person that's broke. It doesn't necessarily have to be a millionaire, multimillionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, whatever. This can be a person that's broke but just has a job and they're trusting that job solely for their livelihood. And they're forgetting that everything that they need is within, the kingdom within. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That camel is not going through a sewing needle, but a, a gateway that was in the city. It's really metaphorically. Think about this. The camel had to be unloaded of its burden. And likewise with us, if we're going to enter into the spiritual realm or the kingdom of heaven, we have to be unburdened by the cares of this world. See, it's difficult when we're trusting on the without. I meet people who have little money and people who have great deals of money, and they fall into this dilemma. And they say, you know, coach, it's hard for me to grasp these spiritual principles, you know, and when I'm living in this realm called reality, when you're looking on the without and you're forgetting that mine is first source, you begin thinking that the government, that your spouse, that your children, that your employer, that all of these things on the without is controlling your day. But nothing can be further from the truth. What's really controlling your day is your thoughts about the government, your spouse, your children, your employer. Depending upon your thoughts, it's going to determine how you feel, how you respond, how you react in your daily lives, and even how you manifest and what you manifest. It's easier for us to spiritualize being broke than to understand that if we're broke, it's not because God desires for us to be broke, because Jesus said it this way, that I've come that you have life and that you have life more abundantly. And we're also told that God gives us richly to enjoy all things. Poverty is not God's ideal. Matter of fact, when you look back at the Old Testament, when you look at the curse, he says that your land will not prosper. You know, your, your ground will be like brass and it won't grow. And you'll be the borrower, not the lender. You'll be the tail and not the head. These are those who are impoverished. When you're walking in a mindset of wealth, then you take on the opposite mindset. And I want to say to you that when you look at, and I'm just going to look at the people that fall up under Judaism, Christianity, 
Islam, all of these are children of Abraham. Now, why do I bring this up? When you look at the wealth of the world, some of the wealthiest people fall up under Christianity, Islam, Judaism. What is that saying? That we can't serve a God of lack, loss, and limitation, but we serve a God of wisdom, wellness, and wealth. We serve a God of more than enough. We've spiritualized poverty to such an extent that many of us in the religious community, and we've carried that over into spirituality, but many of us have come from Christianity or other belief systems that glamorize poverty. When someone talks about, like a Steve Harvey, and he talks about, listen, if rich people don't sleep, for example, we get upset with the notion that, first and foremost, that there's work involved, but secondly, that, that we can seemingly glamorize what appears to be wealth. But God is not against wealth, no more than he is against poverty, but God is not a God of impoverishment. You can look at your grass, for example, for those who have lawns. You don't see one blade of grass that grows. You see it multiplied. Anything that God does, it multiplies. It's not solely just one thing that's created and it stops. That's just not God's nature, nor is it our nature. Poverty is not God's ideal. Poverty is man's ideal. God is a God of abundance. He knows nothing but lavish abundance. God does not do anything sparingly. Everything is always overdone. You look at a tree, you look at snowfall, you look at rain, everything always comes in abundance. So now let's go back to scripture. Jesus said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, the eye of the needle, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples were so dismayed because they understood that they had a livelihood. These were fishermen. These were tax collectors. These were men of various professions. And they said, but Lord, we've left all to follow. He said, listen, what I'm saying is that it's hard for a person who trusts in riches, the resources on the outside, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because there's a conflict going on. When we're looking to the world without as solely the cause, then we can't see that we're the cause. But when we begin to understand that we're the cause, then we begin to control the world without. And as we control the world without, then we begin to attract into our lives abundance, loving relationships, better health, whatever it is that you desire. Like I said, the goal should not be to glamorize or to make it more spiritual to have than to have not. Neither is good or bad. It's just one's preference. As I shared with someone recently concerning manna, it says that those who gathered little, it was enough. For those who gathered much, it was also enough. God is not judging us on our wealth or our lack thereof. We're the cause. If you want to be more abundant, then begin thinking more abundant thoughts. If you want to be less abundant, then, of course, think less abundant thoughts. And that seems to be easier for most of us. But my whole point is, you're given to choose the life that you will live. So if it's a life of abundance, you're given to choose that. If it's a life of lack, then you're given to choose that. You say, well, coach, you don't understand you know, what I'm going through. No matter what it is that you're going through, you can change your circumstances at any moment. It won't change overnight as far as in the outward appearance, but the second you start changing the way that you think, and I'm speaking from personal experience. The moment you begin to change the way you think, your outer world will begin to mold itself, shape itself, begin to conform to your new ideology. But remember this, creators, that only you can create your perfect world, not God or man. Only you can create your perfect world. This is Coach DiCarlo saying have a great and abundant day.